And Lord, we praise your name for what happened on that day. And we thank you humbly for the forgiveness that you bought. We love you, Lord. And now as we open your word, would you open our hearts and minds, plant the seed that you want deep in our heart that it might grow and bear fruit for your kingdom. In the name of Christ, amen. Please be seated. Well, this Easter, this Lenten season leading to Easter, we have been pondering Peter's path. And I wanted to share with you that Monday, as I begin to ponder the next step that we would examine of Peter's path, I, uh, I felt, I, I, as I prepared, I, I ended up posting something on Facebook, um, which I'm new to Facebook So, uh, but anyway, I posted this. I wanted to share this with you, uh, a little bit of my day. As I ponder Peter's path, preparing for this Sunday's time of prayer and praise as we prime for Paschal, I am surprised and presently puzzled at the perplexity of the pericope. When Jesus petitions the apostles with a ponderous probe, they put forth the prevalent proposals postulated by the populace. When he presses the paramount point to a personal place, Peter percolates a perceptive proclamation. So I thought about calling this message today, would y'all say that with me? The ponderous probe of paramount personal importance. But I decided not to. And... uh, Actually, this one is about the most important question you will ever answer, which, I mean, that, you know, basically, but someone posted after I, someone commented on my post that they hoped the P on my keyboard would stop working. (laughs) So uh, anyway, I, I can't imagine why. The most important question you will ever answer, um, I uh, did a little research on some of the most important questions ever asked, and I I found a top 25 list. Uh, I narrowed it down because some of them just didn't seem important to me at all. So I narrowed it down to the top 10 most important questions that are out there, and I wanted to share those with you to get us to all start thinking about important questions, all right? So the top 10 most important questions ever, number 10 How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Three. Isn't that the way it is? Number nine, where does nougat come from? Somebody knows. All I know is I like it. Um, Why do battery letters skip from A to C? Okay. Okay. Why do most snooze buttons only give you nine more minutes of sleep? If y'all come up with answers to these, I really would like to know those. Um, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Very important questions. Is it possible to own property on the moon? Why can't you tickle yourself? What are sea monkeys anyway? Raise your hand if you ever had sea monkeys. Come on, be honest. Come on. Really? It's amazing. Who is that AOL guy who eerily knows when you've got mail? Who is that guy and how does he know? Lastly, what makes number two pencils so darn special? Okay, those are not important questions. Now, they are worth pondering for a few seconds each, but they're not very important. In the text that we go to today as we ponder Peter's path, this is one of the most significant days in Peter's life. And as we lead up to this, I mean, we've, we've, we've talked about how Peter was called, how he dropped his nets along with others. To begin to follow Jesus. And as he followed Jesus, he began to witness 
not only the teachings of Jesus, but he witnessed miracle after miracle, amazing things. And we saw last week how those amazing things led Peter to a place where he had the faith. He had the stretchy kind of faith that he, where he was willing to say, Lord, if that's you out there walking on the water, you call me and I can come. And he ends up walking on water. As the days progress, Peter continues to grow in his faith. Peter continues to ponder who this Jesus really is. Interestingly enough, there was a time where Jesus came. He was in the boat with the apostles and and they all got afraid. And then he quietened the storm and they all said to themselves, this is what the text says. They all said to him themselves, who is this man? That even the waves obey him. But then it said after Jesus and Peter got in the boat. This was a couple of chapters later. A couple of who knows weeks months later. When Jesus and Peter got back in the boat. From Jesus walking on the water. And then Peter and he sunk. And then he came up. He steps in the boat and it says. They worshipped him. They were amazed. And they worshipped him. Now that's a, that's a significant change from wondering who is this guy to, to responding to him with worship. But we come to this, this place in the gospel stories where it's just Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus knows that he's about to have to turn a corner, a big corner in his ministry. He's about to have to head to Jerusalem for the last time. He's about to have to really start seriously telling them that he has to go and suffer and die. He's going to come to a place very soon where it's going to matter. The answer to this question is going to matter big. So let's go to the text. And let's discover the question. And then we'll talk about the answers. The text is Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 18. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Now, that's an odd phrase for us today, the son of man. It's odd we say, what does that mean exactly? We know he's the son of God, the son of man. Exactly what does that refer to? Why did Jesus use that phrase? Why didn't he just say, who do people say that I am? There's a reason he used that phrase. And to understand it, we would have to be a first century Jew who grew up listening to particular text being read. We would have to be one of those that grew up hearing about the Messiah coming. And one of those texts that was always referred to the Messiah was from Daniel. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Let's read this together and consider how it informs the text that we're reading today. In Daniel, it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now understand that most likely, as soon as that phrase was mentioned, the son of man, this would have been the text that everyone listening to Jesus in that moment would have immediately thought about. It's sort of like if I said... 
for God so loved the world. You would automatically think of what? John 3.16. Most of us, at some point in our life, we memorize that, probably in a vacation Bible school. We memorize that text. And a lot of us, we see it. We see the, in, in, even in football games, there's people carrying the posters that say John 3.16. And so if we hear a part of that text, we automatically know, oh, that's, that's that. Now, whether or not we fully understand the meaning and all of that stuff, the point is, it immediately takes us in our mind to that text. I believe that's what happened right here. When Jesus said, who do, the, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus was referring to the Messiah and referring to himself. You see, the moment had come where he needed them to really begin to understand who he was was. Now they weren't going to understand fully what that meant and how this was all going to play out because you see their understanding of the Messiah had been crafted and, and, and confused by all sorts of events. There were some that believed that the Jewish Messiah would come and be a political hero. There were some that believed that he would come and simply restore Israel to its uh, prominent status as the chosen nation. There were all sorts of ideas about how the Messiah would do what he would do and who the Messiah would be. But Jesus needed them to begin to understand truly who he was. So they postulated <laughs> the different things that the populace had, was thinking they replied, some say, John the Baptist. That you were just a continuation of the guy that was crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Others say Elijah. Elijah was the most powerful prophet most would consider in Jewish history. So in other words, you are just... Uh, the reincarnation of Elijah, who was supposed to return. And still others, Jeremiah, one of the other prominent prophets of the Old Testament, or just one of the prophets. Interestingly enough, the populace today, we still have all sorts of ideas about who Jesus really was. Depending on who you ask, depending on where they live, Depending on what they've taught, what they've been taught, or what they've read. There are many people in this world, in fact, Muslims even, will tell you that Jesus was a prophet. But that's where it stops. There are many ideas about who he was and the significance of his life. Understand. The ideas are out there because it is important. It was important on this day when Jesus gathered with his just his few disciples. It's also important today in our life. So when they tell him, here's what some of the people are saying. Here are the different ideas that people have put out there. He pushes it further and he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Who do you believe that I am? Understand that back then, even more so than today, if you spoke it, it represented what you believe. In fact, Jesus actually taught that out of a man's heart, the mouth speaks. So you wonder where things come from. He says, well, they come from your heart. Who do you say that I am? So Simon Peter answered. Now it's interesting that 
We don't get a record of any of the other ones answering this particular question. The Gospels that record it, all of the synoptic Gospels record this event, and they all basically say the same thing, that Peter answered this question on this day. And here's how he answered it. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, we've already, we've, we've used quite a few terms already today. We've used Son of Man. We've used Messiah. We've used the Christ. And we've used the Son of the living God. Understand that all of those are connected. When you go from, for the most part, the Jews had begun to use the word Messiah, Savior, Messiah, as their word for the one who would come and save Israel. But most people didn't speak Hebrew now. And so when the Hebrew, when you translated from the Hebrew Messiah into the Greek, what came commonly used for the Hebrew word for Messiah was the Greek word Christo, Christ. Same meaning though, Savior, the one who saves. You are the one. Not a Christ. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah that all the prophets have talked about. You are the Son of Man. You are the Son of God. You are the one whose all authority has been given to. Now understand that this is what Peter was saying when he made that statement. This was a big leap. Do you get that in the text? Most likely, as they all stood around there, and Peter said it out loud. Most likely, all of them had been thinking, Jesus might be the one. But we are not, it's not recorded that any of them had actually said it yet. You've been in a situation where everyone was thinking something, but nobody was willing to say it, I'm sure. And then finally, somebody said it. Maybe at a family gathering, right? And somebody says what everybody's thinking and everybody goes. <gasps> now, I'm not sure that there was a collective gasp in the group of disciples that day, but I bet you it was something like that. I think Peter got this a lot. When he was in the boat and he said, if it's you, tell me to walk out on the water. I bet you they all went, what? What? And I bet in this situation, when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, I think they all went. He said it. You see, this was a turning point. Jesus had asked the most important question, and it is this question that would remain important for the rest of the disciples' lives, as they go and as they see Him crucified on the cross, it is this question, who do you say that I am? It's that question that's important. And when they find the empty tomb, it's that question, who do you say that I am? And when He returns and when He ascends into heaven, it's that question that remains. It reverberates through history. Who do you say? I am. And how you answered that question, how people from that day forward answered that question has been the most important issue ever. Because it is this question that our eternal salvation hinges on. Here's the way Jesus replied to Peter in that moment. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, Peter Petra, the rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now throughout history, this text has been debated, and depending on how you grew up and what you were taught, there's all sorts of opinions in this room about exactly what Jesus meant when he said, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Was he speaking of the rock of Peter's faith? Was he speaking of Peter himself? Peter would go on to become the first leader of the Christian church. Basically the first pope. I think what's important here is that the church will be established. And hell. Hell itself. The gates of Hades or hell will not overcome the church. But you see. This is the question. When Jesus, he said, guys, I know we've been kind of doing this and this is this is how we've been and what we've been doing and, you know, healing people and teaching and all of this kind of stuff. But guys, today, everything is changing. And we are about to head. I guess that's west. Maybe we should head east toward Jerusalem. Everything is about to change. And it hinges on this question. So as we ponder Peter's path. We truly need to ask ourselves. That same question. Allow Jesus. To speak this question. Into your heart. You know, right now there's a um, there's a devotional called Jesus Calling. You seen this? Jesus Calling. It's a really good devotion guide. It's neat because it is written from the perspective of Jesus speaking to the reader. And I've I've used this a little bit, and it, it really does change it when you read it in that way. When Jesus is speaking to you in this way. I wonder if we could all just take a moment and try to allow Jesus to ask us this question. Who do you say that I am? When we turn into John 3.16, and this is that, that verse that is so popular and so many people have heard it, we begin to understand why this question is so important and why is it why it, it is important that we ask people and that we live out the answer that we have because it is so crucial for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him In other words, whoever believes that he is my son and that he is the Christ that I sent. He's the Messiah that was sent to save the world. And he's the one that if you'll believe in him, you won't perish. But you'll have eternal life. That your spirit, which is dead because of sin, can be raised and you can live life As God intended his special creation, humankind, to live. What about you? Who do you say that I am? It's important because in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. It is so easy for us to begin to 
get caught up in the service aspect of loving people. And we get so caught up in that that we forget that there's a question echoing through everything. There's a question that matters. And we can serve people and we can feed people and we can give of ourselves so that others can have things that they need. We can support Allie and all that she's doing. But Allie knows this in Cambodia. And Pastor Carlos knows this in Costa Rica. That it's this question. Who is Jesus to you? That's the question that's going to matter. It matters right here in America. How you answer that question. It matters to those, those little children who Allie and her, her friends are, are trying to rescue. This question matters to those little kids. This question matters no matter who you are, no matter where you're from. This question matters. So we're going to close our time today. And let this question sink deep into us. There's some of us in this room that we really still need to answer this for ourselves. Hey, there's no shame in that. If you're at a place in your life where you've been exploring, you've been wondering, but you know in your heart that you've never answered this question, where you've never said, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. And I want to put my trust in Him. Today's a good day to do that. But there's some of us in this room that we have done this. It may have been years ago. It might have been two weeks ago. We've done this. But now the question is, will we ask that question for others, to others, on their behalf? Because to love them, to feed them, to clothe them without Asking this question at some point may be a waste of time. Let's pray. Lord God, speak to our hearts today. And push this question deeper and deeper and deeper into our heart. In such a way, brand it on our heart that it might never leave our heart. That this question matters. And Lord, help us to respond in faith. The same way Peter did. And even though he didn't fully understand what it would mean... We don't either fully understand what it will mean. But Lord, we know that it's this question that's going to matter. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice and respond today in the name of Christ. Amen.